Hi guys. Um, a while back, I asked, um, made a post and asked you guys if there were any interest in tutorials, either mixing, mastering, or general production stuff. And the general consensus seemed to be that um, mixing and getting professional loudness, uh, specifically for harder types of techno, like industrial, um, would uh, were of most interest. Let's talk about, uh, you know, mixing and getting proper loudness for, um, or proper loudness, but uh, loud loudness for your tracks. So <clears throat> loudness starts from, really from the get-go in your project. Um, it has to do with everything from the samples that you choose to the synthesis that you do, um, and obviously how you know, how you treat them with, with processing and, and um, different effects and scents. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, many people's goal today is purely loudness w at whatever cost. Um, um, you can you can hear that by listening to the modern EDM producers uh, like D David Guetta or Martin Garrix. You know, it's really loud, but it sounds like absolute horse shit. Um, with this tutorial, we're not going into those stupid levels of loudness. Like, um, we're not going to be talking about like minus five or minus four LUFS because there's no point, absolutely no point. Um, there's nothing to gain from that. Um, so I'm going to be aiming for like roughly around minus nine, minus ten LUFS at maybe minus one dB true peak. Um, and keep in mind, this is a mix down. This is not a master. This is a mix down and minus minus nine, ten LUFS is not only loud enough, but actually very loud for a mix down. Um if you send that to a proper good mastery engineer, they can easily get that up to minus six without, you know, um without any crazy amounts of compression or limiting on it. I've written down uh three things that I think are crucial um, to bring in with you in your project if loudness is what you want to achieve. Intention, compromise, and psychoacoustics. That's my little recipe. Now let's go through them one by one, obviously. So the first one, intention. Uh, you have to make sure to consider every element's intention. Uh, what's their purpose? Are they um, are they very prominent? Are they far away? Are they panned left or right? Um, what frequency range does the body of the instrument lie in? Um, you know, consider if if all of your all all of your elements really should be there. Um, maybe some of them are just masking or drawing attention away from your main attractions, so to speak. Um, so a lot of times it's actually a good idea to strip down your um, your project. Um, it's entirely possible to make a banging techno track with 10 or 15 tracks. You don't need more, honestly. Um, and stripping it down will make it easier. And sometimes even sound much better as well. Um, so that was intention. Number two is compromise. So... You simply have to compromise to achieve loudness, end of story. Um, gain staging and EQing, um, you know, controlling how all of these instruments uh, cooperate and uh, blend together. Um, you need to, like, reduce the amount of in instruments that take up the same frequency range. That's kind of the same thing as with intention. Um, but, um, but maybe you don't need four hi-hats maybe you can settle for two if you have two hi-hats maybe one should maybe one should be in the mids in the higher mids and one should be in the highs um you know just an example just carving out space for each instrument um stuff like that calming down resonances applying low pass high pass filtering carving out anything that doesn't really need to be there um Obviously, you know, good signal to noise ratio if you're recording, things like that. Um, number three, psychoacoustics. Um, a lot of loudness is really only 
perceived loudness, really. That's what we're talking about with LUFS. Um, so LUFS, LU stands for loudness units, FS for full scale. That's the digital, um, um, the digital measuring system for audio, where 0, 0.0 f dBFS is the absolute max. If you go past that, the audio, audio signal will be clipped off. Uh, it's like it's a brick brick wall limiter, basically. <clears throat> so the LUFS scale is tries to mimic um, how the human brain perceives sound, which obviously is very very difficult. But as in as in the human brain, the mid range in the LUFS, the the area between one kilohertz to five kilohertz, is where where our hearing is the most sensitive. Um, <clears throat> and this has to do with stuff in your brain, you know, because you hear with your brain, not your ears. Um, so boosting the mids will inevit inevitably be a very big contributing factor to perceived loudness and to your LUFS readings. Um, so if we take again take the example of like modern EDM productions, David Guetta, Martin Garrix, whatever, uh, that's what they do. They cut out a lot of the low end and then just boost the mids. Um, and again, it sounds like shit, but it's loud, and that, you know, I don't know, f fair enough, I guess. So yeah, that's my little little recipe: uh, intention, compromise, and psychoacoustics. Those those three three things. Um, not only, I mean, if you guys have any ideas on 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 it too then and please please share that um but this is you know what i what i try to keep in mind um so let's get into it uh, my first thing is going to be eqing equalization i've jumped into ableton here um and first of all i just uh figured we'd have a listen Right, so that's that. This is an old track of mine called Gently Whispering. Um, and if we have a quick look through, first of all, you're going to notice that um, there's actually not that much compression going on, on as inserts, at least. Um, so in my opinion, uh, con and contrary to popular belief, compression isn't always the best way of achieving loudness in this like sleek and sexy way. What I mainly use is subtractive dynamic EQ, and this is by far more efficient than compression or additive EQ. And this is since um, I think that you have more and uh, more control and more uh, accurate and and you can be more surgical with dynamic EQ than with compression. Uh, actually, with compression, a lot of times, if uh, especially if you're you're a beginner, you can cause more problems with with compression um, than you're solving. Hence, um, kind of putting you one step back in your quest for <laughs> for loudness. Right now, we're going to focus on on dynamic EQ first of all, um, and I want to recommend the M Auto Dynamic EQ from Melda Audio. Uh, I'm not sponsored or paid by Melda Audio <laughs> at all, but um, but let's just start with the fir first first um, like very obvious thing, and that would be high pass and low pass filtering. Um, so on my First of all, on my kick drum, I don't have anything because I just want the kick drum to to shine uh, through because uh, it's such an important part. It's what's it's what's drive drives the track forward. I would say in the first main rhythm section, I have uh, carved out a high pass filter, and this is because this is the area where 
the root note of the kick drum is. Uh, so that's that high pass filter there, right there. In the second rhythm section, same EQ, I've also carved out uh, the space for the kick drum and also put it a bit higher for um, to accommodate space for the first rhythm section that starts to take over in this area. And then I just continued down um, really um, again the acid synthesizer here uh, carved out space for the kick, the first rhythm section and the second rhythm section. Same with um, hi-hats, uh, things like that. Um, you go, I go higher and higher depending on where the body, again, um, keep in mind where the body of the instrument lies or where you want the body of the instrument to lie. Uh, now, make sure to not uh, solo them. Uh, you wanna hear the, uh, you wanna hear the change in the big picture. What we need to keep in mind with uh, when we apply especially low pass filtering is that that brings out or can bring out a lot of really harsh resonances. Uh, so let me uh, grab an example for you here. Uh, oops, <laughs> that was weird. Um, and right. <clears throat> So right now we have a high pass at roughly 100 hertz here. So I'm gonna play this without the um, um, without the high pass first of all. Right? Did you hear that? At roughly 500, 600 hertz, um, we start to have a very, very abrasive and, and a fa fatiguing sound. And this is kind of because you're changing the body or the timbre of the fundamental of the instrument and the overtones start to take over. Uh, now, overtones, um, read up a bit on the overtone series, the harmonic overtone series, um, and then you'll know more what I'm talking about, uh, but that's a, that's a really, really cool thing to know about. Um, but yeah, just keep that in mind, um, the resonances and also high pass and low pass filters can actually make your peak, uh, output louder, even though you're cutting, like removing information. Um, in this instance, it's roughly the same roughly the same but you can still see that the output is actually louder with the high pass than without so that's why i made the um, adjustment here of uh, minus um, minus 0 0.82 db when you have your uh, low pass or your high pass filters uh, in place and you're happy with them i st i start to move on to bigger um, cuts or boosts so let's first of all talk about the relationship of the kick drum and the main percussion because that's I think what's most important here uh, let's play those together soloed <laughs> as you can hear they together consists maybe of like 60 percent of the track honestly or 50 um so in those two i need to be very wary of what changes i am making so again we did the high pass and now i wanted this the main rhythm section to be prominent in the low mids now i've carved out space here for the kick drum so then it would make sense to do the same in the kick drum to carve out some space for the rhythm section in the kick drum now, this is what I call the mid lows. You know, I usually always start with the low end material because uh, it, it makes sense. And, and this is what I call like kind of space wasters because some frequencies just take more space than others. So for low frequency material, we need higher levels for the same perceived loudness. 
Same goes for drums or any instrument where the transient is the most prominent thing, like bass, uh, kick, low toms, uh, things that have longer waveforms that you know tend to die off um, like more slowly. Anyway, what I call the mid lows uh, lie between roughly between 100 to 250 hertz, and these can normally mask or take up unnecessary space from the lows and the mids. And these frequencies belong to a bigger area that potentially can make a track boxy. So this is why I want to push down these, or not push down, but calmly, like calm down. Uh, so I do this not only to gain space for the first rhythm section in the mids, but also to give the kick more authority here in the lows where it it has its main body. Um, so let's let's listen to that combination again. Now, do you hear that? That's a very um, that's a slight difference, but it actually, in the big picture, it makes makes a big difference. So, uh, let's just solo that with the uh, only the kick drum. Now, I've set my uh, this is dynamic EQ, so it's pushing down only really what I tell it to do. And in this instance, you can hear that kind of ringing, like that type of sound. And that's what I want to remove. I don't want to remove the initial transient, like the, the nice part of the kick drum. I want to keep that intact. So I set my attack and release times uh, accordingly so that it only pushes down that annoying ringing sound. Because that is... Uh, the ooh, 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 is what's going to take out space from um, um, this. It's going to it's going to mask and start to face cancel each other. This won't only give you more perceived volume, but actual actual more head headroom because you know these frequency frequencies eat a large amount of of space, and then you can apply this as necessary or as needed or what you think sound good. Uh, this is really only a question of experimenting and finding your own way. Um, maybe you won't be using the same EQ as me or, um, you know, fi finding your own way of, of what works. But this is a very, very a clean, surgical way of achieving loudness, carving out uh, carving out, calming down space for each individual um, instrument so that they cooperate nicely together. Uh, instead of just smashing everything with a compressor, this is a really good alternative to that. Um, cool, let's move on. So before we were talking about that high pass filters can bring out uh, harsh resonances. And I wasn't just saying that and then <laughs> forgetting about it. Uh, we actually need to deal with these. Again, this is because you're they come out because you change the the timbre or the body of the instrument and mostly the overtones come out. These resonances will most likely accumulate around 1 to 5 kilohertz. Um, this also increases the risk of face cancellation in this area. You know sometimes when you hear a track where the the mids and the highs are kind of harsh and unpleasant and very tiring, fatiguing, but they're still dull and not really enough. This could be what's going on, is that a lot of frequencies, <clears throat> resonances have accumulated here and cancel each other out, but they're still kind of this whistling, annoying uh, stuff going on that you don't want there. Um, I'm going to be taking the um, the second uh, rhythm section as an example. Uh, 
Let me just show you what these can sound like. Not very pleasant to listen to. Now, I don't want to remove these resonances altogether because if you do, then imagine like an ice sculpture, you're shipping away too much and eventually there's just going to be nothing left. What we want to do is calm them down and have them not be the most prominent part. If you want to, to increase um, the highs or the mids, you can also do that um, and bring out the nice brightness of that area without it becoming harsh. Uh, so this is a smart technique to implement. That's it for EQ. Let's move on. My second uh, like best trick for uh, loud, clean mixes is send, actually. Um, Ascend is effectively a channel where you can send clones of one or multiple tracks into an auxiliary channel. Um, you can then apply effects on this channel, like uh, reverb, compression, saturations, uh, and then you can control the level uh, you want to send out to the master channel. And this is basically the same thing as a wet dry function you see on a lot of plugins today. However, they are, there are uh, a lot of advan advantages to doing this on sends versus on uh, inserts, uh, insert effects uh, directly on the track. Um, so, uh, first of all, you save, um, save a lot of processing power. Um, so, you can send uh, everything you want reverb on, you can send to one send, uh, one auxiliary channel where you have one reverb instead of having six reverbs that take up processing power. Um, and you will all also avoid the problem of like smearing everything with different reverbs that has different decay times, uh, which and they will start masking each other and make your mix a mess. So if you do that and your mixes stop immediately and uh, use one, maybe two reverbs, but honestly, one is enough. Uh, this is also perfect for uh, saturation, um, for warmth and for loudness. Uh, saturation um, can actually smear your transients. So be careful with it on things such as kick drums or anything really that needs a transient to punch through in the mix. Uh, in that case, it's much better to do this on sends. The most interesting ones are C and D. And uh, let's listen to them quickly. That was C and D. Now, C. So let me go through my workflow here or my signal flow. Saturation first, the Molot compressor, and last, uh, M audio dynamic EQ. Now, why is the EQ last, you think? Wouldn't it be better to put it here so that I cut the low frequencies before it gets into the saturation and the compressor? No, that's exactly what I want here. Listen to this. Now I'm gonna move it. I want the compressor and saturation, saturation, especially the compressor, to react to the to the uh, lower parts of the uh, spectrum that I'm sending to it uh, to to get that highly compressed sound. Uh, if you listen to early '90s techno, especially from like Sweden or the UK, this is very common. Um, personally, for me, it's not for loudness; it's more of an aesthetic choice. Um, it also happens to pump up those uh, LUFS values, uh, but here you like you can go bananas. Like really, you can mess around a lot here. You can do like crazy amounts of of compression, um, and you get the best of the both worlds. So you, you can pump up uh, the perceived loudness with saturation and compression without without compressing the whole signal. I would also say here is one one part where you can actually 
decrease your attack times. Remember, I told you about that that, that can mess with transients and stuff like that. But uh, but and it can and it probably will. Uh, but that's kind of what you want here. You want that pumping, groovy compressor sound, uh, especially using a compressor that has a lot of character, like this one from TDR, uh, Molot compressor. Let's move on to D. Um, this is actually very sim similar. So I have a, uh, here instead, I have an EQ first uh, where I pull down the lows. Then it goes into the saturation unit from Klanghelm. And then I'm putting in, in a limiter, uh, the TDR limiter, 6 GE. Same thing here, basically, this this is for loudness. Uh, look at the uh, LUFS reading on only this. We're at... <laughs> <laughs> We're at minus 3.3 LUFS. Um, we can also hear how well these complement each other, where uh, the C is more in the um, lower mids to mids. And the um, D is more in the high mids and highs. And then I put them pretty loudly back out into the master. Uh, yeah, I wanted to show you as well the... Um, uh, so this is my master. So let's just m remove the sends C and D here and then compare the loudness with and without. So they add at least a full loudness, uh, unit, loudness unit. This is one way of getting that really like smashed industrial sound without sacrificing the integrity of your transients and your dynamics. Let's move on. So let's move on to uh, imaging and panning. Learning how to use stereo width panning and the uh, what's called the phantom middle is uh, kind of crucial uh, when you're trying to get uh, loud and clean mixes. Two quick examples here um with my uh hi hats here right now they're playing right down the center um <clears throat> just two closed hi hats one playing 16th notes one one just playing the backbeat um absolutely nothing special with that at all um <clears throat> uh, but like i said before when you're trying to place something with a either eq compression or imaging volume uh, never do it solo always do it uh, with everything playing at the same time so that's what i'm gonna do <laughs> switch these um. yeah so that is like they were on uh they were on uh six both of them before as well And doing it again now, uh, I must say that that's kind of the sweet spot. That sounds that sounds right to me, at least. And here, I also like to kind of have a yin and yang mindset. Um, if I pan something six left, I also want to pan something six right. So working in tandem like this works much better, um, as you will keep the whole mix in mind, not just the individual instrument. Let's talk a little bit about a mono uh, versus not mono. <clears throat> uh, personally, it kicks always mono. Uh, it's for me, it's a taste thing. There's nothing right or wrong with anything. 
Um, but one thing that I think can help is using uh, something like the Ozone uh, Imager from Isotope, for example. There are other ones that are good too, but this is the one that I use. <clears throat> um, so in the uh, if we take the uh, first rhythm section here, just as an example again. <laughs> There's quite a lot of information on the sides, uh, especially here. Uh, or not not especially there, but <clears throat> definitely some stuff flowing around there. Um, and I want, I'm interested to see how uh, that works with the kick drum, if I just pull that in towards the middle a bit more. So let's, uh, let's uh, try that. That for me around minus 77 is kind of the sweet spot. Uh, I also want to check here in the in the mids here. <clears throat> what I forgot to mention, my goal here with the mids is that uh, since a lot of the transient in the kick drum lies here. <clears throat> the transient in the kick drum in the sample, I mean. And I want that to kind of blend and melt uh, together with my kick drum. So let's uh, try this together with the kick drum and the main <clears throat> percussion rhythm section. And uh, I've gain matched here so that there's no loudness perception and then I will just bypass and we'll compare. Do you hear that? It's not night and day, it's very subtle, but uh, with this, it kind of feels like the um, um, the kick drum and the, um, the main rhythm section here are cooperating a bit more, and um, it kind of feels actually a bit louder and a bit more um, that it comes to life better. Uh, that's what I think, at least. Also, yeah, you don't have to have like a super fancy um, ozone, whatever expensive thing. You can do this with simple means by, uh, by um, I'm gonna show you actually how to do that with a, an EQ that everyone has, um, which would be maybe like the EQ8 or something from Ableton. Um, and it's pretty simple. You just, um, you go in here stereo, you have left, right or mid side. Um, so mid side, uh, you can edit mids or sides. Uh, so mids would be everything that's playing right down the middle and sides, obviously that's, um, everything that's pan left, right, uh, diff and some difference and some. <laughs> So that's roughly the same principle. Um, sometimes it's also a good idea to just simply cut out all the lows from the sides. A lot of club systems are mono below 150, 100 hertz, which means that this information would not really be useful either way. Okay, so that was all I had on imaging and panning. Um, so let's move on to some more technical stuff about uh, peaks.
So the true peak of an audio signal actually lies between two measure points in a sample. Um, and this is why they don't show up on your uh, your uh, DAW stock meter. Uh, this is because they can't catch these um, um, the in between the two measure points. Um, so they're called true peak or intersample peaks, uh, and these normally peak above your meter in your uh, DAW. Um, sometimes as much as two, three uh, decibel. Uh, not common, but it, it can happen. And this is why in mixing, we need to leave headroom for the mastering engineer. A lot of people ask me, uh, why do I need to pull my my um, uh, mix down or pre-master down to minus six uh, dB or minus nine or minus three or whatever it is? Um, why can't I just leave it at zero or minus one? Um, so this is the reason to accommodate space for... Uh, possible intersample peaks to make sure the track is not clipping. So if you do this, your job is done. There's no need to worry about intersample peaks or ISPs uh, further. Um, this is where in mastering, uh, true peak limiting and dithering comes in. Uh, but again, this is the mastering engineer's headache. So <clears throat> the cure for intersample peaks uh, either is to turn down turn down the master so you know when you're rendering uh, you're not going above um, or to control these you can use a transparent sounding true peak limiter um, and this is never to be used on the master in a um, in a mix down ever um, it is however completely fine to use limiters on individual track channels um, uh, personally, I love putting limiters on my kick drums. This is because I, I know that the kick will most likely be the highest peaking element of my track. So putting a limiter with a threshold at, let's say, minus 1 dB, uh, that will ensure that my mix will most likely not peak above 0 0.0, .0 dBFS. Um, and limiting kicks can also help to improve the perceived impact while keeping the peak level down. Um, so again, let's keep in the mind the concept of compromise. So with my signal flow on the kick drums channel, I've reduced the peak by almost 2 dB, but I've actually increased the perceived loudness. So uh, let's uh, take a look at that right now. Right. So this is what's going on on the limiter here. I'm doing some roughly, yeah, 1.8 dB of gain reduction on the kick drum. The, um, so again, to control the true peak um, and to maximize the impact of the kick drum. Um, I have set up here the M Compare from Melda Audio. <clears throat> um, so this is a gain match plugin, uh, meaning that you can compare tracks at the same same level. Um, and this is to remove any loudness deception. Um, so if I press here, we're listening to the original source. So this will remove the uh, limiter and the... Um, uh, the EQ, um, and uh, let's take a look at that. So my peak on the, um, my true peak on the kick drum is minus one dB. Um, and as you know, as it comes to compromise, I th I'm super happy with this. Uh, I'm not really compromising the kick that much, but I've uh, I've controlled the peaks, but I still get to um, keep the benefits, so to speak. So this is a cool way of treating your kick drums. Uh, another good example of this is um, the uh, again the main rhythm drum section. Uh, I'm going to show you.
So on the main uh, percussion uh, drum section there, we have a uh, roughly a uh, perceived or a LUF is LUFS value of minus five. My true peak at, is at minus one dB. Now, let me just show you an example. If I were to um, do have the drum section at the roughly the same perceived loudness, but without the limiter. And then we're gonna check our true peak. So this is roughly where the kick drum is. Um, sorry, not the kick drum, the, the main rhythm section here. So now the limiter is not active. True peak of roughly minus four and a short term LUFS reading of minus 14. Uh, now let's compare that and go in on the master. See what's going on there. So Let's say uh, roughly minus 2.6 true peak and minus 13 LUFS. Now let's um, turn this down again to where it was, but let me just turn on the limiter as well. I had minus 17.5 there and then turning back the, the limiter on again. <laughs> Right, so we bought ourselves quite a bit of headroom there just by that uh, small adjustment. Um, minus 2.6 and now it's minus, uh, minus 3.3. So small things like this can uh, accumulate and gives you a lot of headroom to play with uh, while you keep up your perceived loudness. Um, right, um, perfect, let's move on. Uh, let's talk a little bit about compression. So by now, I'm sure you've noticed that I haven't spoken at all about compression, uh, except for limiting. Uh, and you might be a bit confu uh, confused or confounded as to why this is, uh, since compression is nowadays the go-to tool for achieving loudness. And for me, there's a very simple explanation. Uh, a compressor isn't really a tool that is meant to do that, for me at least. Um, for me, a compressor is a problem solver, um, controlling a peak or uh, evening out signals, uh, which in turn obviously can help push your tracks uh, up and, and make them louder. Uh, but compression should not be viewed as a like kind of an all-in-one solution for any problem regarding uh, loudness. Um, and that's what I think a lot of produ producers do today, that they, they just slap a compressor on every track uh, without really thinking it through. Like, why am I applying this compression? Um, so for me, if you apply compression, it should be done with care and attention to detail. And I would personally advise to stay away from, from uh, very fast attack times. Um, anything below, let's say, 50 milliseconds you know, can, uh, or in my personal experience, you know, start to produce strange artifacts and behaviors with your, um, with your transients. Um, and you want to keep transients nice and snappy, you know, to, to, to punch through in the mix. So transients are also needed to, to, to get loudness or perceived loudness. Um, so they shouldn't be eradicated with compression check your meters. Are you really increasing the perceived loudness? Are you solving a problem? Or are you just decreasing the, the um, dynamic range and uh, creating this unpleasant sausage waveform um, that just sounds harsh and, and, and like fatiguing for the ear? You know, keep in mind as well that compression doesn't always work. 
um, or I mean, it works. It does the job, but but uh, but it can actually leave you with the same or a lower LUFS reading at an equal or higher peak value than you had before, um, leaving the track dull and without any pop. So in that case, it's much better to keep the transients intact. In my my opinion or in my experience, compression for loudness works normally works best. Uh, on materials without sharp transients, so like pad synths or um, like, yeah, things like that. Also, the notion of that, very simple, if everything is loud, nothing is loud. Just let that sink in for a bit and, and try to wrap your head around that. For me, it's it's such a um, powerful thing to, to keep in mind. What we also kind of need to keep in mind is that you know uh, these over compressed harsh mid mid boosted tracks are extremely tiring and fatiguing to the ear so even if you hit like <laughs> these ridiculous loudness lufs readings um the end consumer will most likely turn it down anyway since it does not sound good uh, it like it feels like someone is poking a stick into your ear so just keep that in mind as well again i i I don't have anything against loudness and and absolutely like hitting minus seven lufs that's that that's extremely loud um but um but that's kind of where techno is at right now uh especially um some more modern uh modern genres anyway the lufs reading is not very important um i've thrown i couldn't think of a better example than to just throw a um compressor on my um on my master here um since i don't really have a drum bus to show you i just figured what the heck let's just throw it on the master um so let me just reset this real quick. There we go. So this is the Mollet uh, GE from Tokyo Dawn Records. And it sits nicely on the master. Um, so let's just see what happens when I apply compression on the master. And um, keep, uh, while you listen and look, try to keep the not only the LUFS reading and the true peak reading in mind, but also the perceived loudness, what you hear. Let's go. This compressor has an equal loudness bypass, which is basically a gain matching uh, feature. So when I press that there, it means that the um, the original source is gain matched um, with the uh, bypassed uh, compressor so that there's no loudness deception there once again. <laughs> Honestly, the perceived loudness is lower with um, with compression on. Uh, now I'm gonna try a bit more um, a bit more gain reduction, apply uh, heavier heavier um, heavier compression, and I will also um, apply my side chaining here. Uh, so I will choose to let's say compress uh, nothing below a certain value here.
honestly, uh, again, this is on the master, but I think this is a good representation of how um, how compression works and and what it's actually doing to the signal. Um, for me, the this is it's duller and it feels like a uh, just a wall of sound hitting me instead of. Um, um, since we put so much work into the mix and placing our instruments where they should be, I think it's a shame to just ruin that with compressing the whole thing. Because that's what people do quite often, that they put a um, uh, compressor on the final, the, on the last stage in the master just to get the loudness up. So this is not something that is unheard of in any, any way. This is, uh, I get a lot of pre-masters with quite heavy compression on the master. And uh, sometimes it's fine, sometimes it actually makes it sound um, much, much better, but then you wouldn't really compress with with loudness in mind, then you would compress for like subtle groove, for example. Um, right, um, I have actually uh, exported this track as well. Um, so we're gonna take a look Remember, uh, minus 13 LUFS, we had a, a low peak value, uh, true peak max value. Right, so you're thinking now, wow, this is this pre-master is not loud at all. Okay. It's loud. Let me tell you, it's really loud. Let me just turn down the master there. Um... So 11, minus 11.3 LUFS short term, roughly uh, at a peak of minus, uh, minus 0 0.5. Uh, <clears throat> you're th probably still thinking, well, this is not, this is not loud. Uh, imagine that a mastery engineer gets this and that the mastery engineer does all this processing, right? Now we haven't done any processing at all, but I'm gonna show you what happens when you put a good transparent peak limiter Let's take a let's take a look. That's very loud. Keep in mind the um, we haven't done any processing or problem solving before this. I'm just slapping the the premaster as it is right into a limiter. Um, <clears throat> and what was it again? Let's uh, let's uh, take a look. There. Right, minus 6.5 uh, LUFS short term before any other problem solving in the uh, quote unquote mastering stage, which means um, if I did a proper master of this, I would probably get it up to minus five. So that's why you don't need to have ridiculously loud pre-masters. Settle for minus 11, that's fine. If you can't get it to that, just make sure that your pre uh, mix down is nice and balanced. Um, leave the rest to the master engineer. That's all I have, guys. Um, again, this turned out to be a bit more of a lecture um, and then a tutorial. I am new to making making this kind of kind of stuff. Um, uh, I haven't really done it before, so and I I would greatly value your input on. Uh, some constructive criticism or if you have any thoughts or uh, also 
you know uh, what I did well would be nice to hear so I can take that with me into the next thing uh, but also things that I can improve um, if it was it too slow was it too long was it um, was it too complicated was it not complicated enough uh, I don't know I think there's in this group there's so many levels of uh, of producers so I, I I wanted to find something uh, or put it you know put the level on somewhere in between so that there's something for everyone but again um would love some input and i hope you you found it found it useful if you have any um uh any questions regarding mixing uh mastering uh whatever it is uh i'm gonna type my email here um so you can you can reach me feel free to reach out um uh, I'm, I'm happy to help if i can um don't forget to have fun and um i'll see you around thank you so much ciao